everyone. On behalf of Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage Intact and the Intact Conservation Institute, I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished speaker, Morena Stephens, and everyone who has joined us for today's talk in the Conservation Insights 2020 lecture series. I'm Dr. Padma Rohila, Director ICI Delhi. Now to introduce our speaker, Morena Stephens has a Bachelor's in Science from the University of Oxford and did her textile, textile conservation from Textile Conservation Center, Kutal Institute of Art, London University. And she's also an Andrew Mellon Fellow. She's presently an independent textiles and ethnogra ethnographic artifacts conservator. While training, she, was, uh, she had placements and contracts at LP3 Muse Conservation and Musée de Larmy in France and at the Fitzwilliam Museum, Cambridge. She has, after a short contract at the Museum of Welsh Life, she was a Museum and Galleries Commission intern in Ethnographic Conservation at the Royal Albert Memorial Museum, Exeter. Since then, Morena has worked as a freelance conservator, working for the National Trust and other heritage organizations, museums, and private clients, with a 2002 fellowship at the National Museum of the American Indian Smithsonian Institution, USA. She carries out intervent interventive conservation treatments alongside collections, care, consultancy, and training, specializing in world cultures, costumes, and textiles. She has experience of working with national, local authority, and independent museums and heritage organizations, working in areas of research of textiles and ethnographic artifacts, interpretation and access, training, development, and implementation of collection care improvements. Some of her projects include the Flying the Flag project with Southwest Museums Development Partnership, which she'll be talking in detail today. And conservation of indigenous and world cultures artifacts for the Royal Albert Memorial Museum, Plymouth Museum and Art Gallery, the American Museum in Britain, Sheltonham Museum and Art Gallery, Birmingham Museums and Art Gallery, to name a few. The title of today's talk is A Procession of Banners, preserving flags and banners in Jeevan and Congo. She will be discussing two interrelated projects, Flying the Flag and Raising the Standard, developed through the Southwest Museum Development Program, to improve the collection care, condition, and interpretation of banners and flags in 10 museums across Devon and Congo, enabling community engagement at each museum. The talk will cover the development of the project through survey, funding bids, surgeries, training workshops, on-site collection care support, conservation, research, enabling community engagement. There'll also be examples of conservation treatments carried out on some of the banners. Now, before I invite Marina Stifford's may I please request all of you to put your microphones on mute. The questions will be taken up right at the end of the presentation. Please type those in the chat box facility. Also type in your name, organization name and email ID. So now I request Morena to start with the presentation. Thank you so much for agreeing for this, Morena. Over Thank you. Thank you, Padma. So hello, I'm going to talk about a project um, that we undertook over several years, um, a few years ago now. Uh, it's sort of finished in 2017, 2018. But I thought it was quite a nice illustration of how we could bring museums together to address a shared problem. And um, there's quite a nice variety of objects to talk about. So I'm based in Exeter. Um, I work out of the Royal Albert Memorial Museum in Exeter. Um, but I thought to give you some background, I talk about textile conservation in southwest England. So there are lots and lots of museums, but very few have conservation departments, um, and those tend to be local authority museums. And then there's a, re a very good innovation that happened about 20 years ago was that a um, conservation development officer was recruited for the whole of southwest England to support the large group and variety of museums within the Southwest. And so Helena Jeski helps and supports the museums identifying their collection care and conservation needs, providing training and so on. 
and putting them in touch with conservators um, as necessary. And so the actual conservation work is carried out generally by independent conservators. And that's true for textile conservation as for other disciplines. So the project I'm focusing on is very much Devon and Cornwall, which were the two most southwestern counties of um, southwest England. The Southwest Development Programme, which facilitated the project, is um, funded by the Arts Council England to support museums across all their activities. So from documentation, public engagement, uh, supporting volunteers and so on. But um, Helena's role fits within this organisation, so it's providing collection care, um, support, advice and training. Um, as a textile conservator, I work on a wide range of objects. So although I'm focusing on banners and flags today, I just thought I'd give you a quick snapshot of some of the projects that I've worked on recently. But in um, around 2013, it became clear from Helena's work that there were banners uh, sort of lurking in stores and museum collections that were posing quite a big challenge for the museums in terms of their fragility, their size, um, their state of deterioration, and Generally, the larger ones especially caused a problem in terms of how to store, how to be able to display, make accessible. Um, so it became clear from um, Helena's visits that, that this was a bit of a, an issue for some of the museums. So then we had to look at um, really, is this a problem? How many people are, or how many museums is this a problem for? So across Southwest England, there are museum development officers, which tend to be more curatorial, but have um, a general um, supporting role to museums across their, um, their region. So there are four museum development officers across Devon and Cornwall. So initially to, to ascertain if there really was a problem rather than a very, um, being a very niche issue, uh, we contacted the museum development officers for Devon and Cornwall to get a sense of whether there were lots of flags and banners, what kind of objects they were, um, so were they linked to the maritime industry, um, did they, were they trade union banners and so on, and the kind of size of the objects and the kind of materials they were made from, and as well as what condition they were. And from that initial um, consultation, it became clear there were banners and flags that needed um, support. So then a more extensive survey was carried out. And so the survey asked a number of questions. Uh, to give you an idea of the type of museums in the Southwest, you see that most of them, over almost 60% of the ones, the respondents, are independent trusts. So some may receive a grant from their local authority, but they're really uh, run as independent museums. Almost a quarter of the respondents were local authority. So that might be like the box in Plymouth, the Royal Cornwall Museum in Truro, um, and museums such as those. Then you have the National Trust, which in Britain is, is an organization that, um, cares for um, the environmental heritage, so nature, natural heritage, a lot of coastline, but also a large number of historic houses. And there are several of these in Devon and Cornwall. And then there are a small number of completely private museums. So looking to see how many banners and flags there were in each museum, most of them actually reported quite small numbers. So, you know, fewer than 10 flags and banners, but um, four museums had much larger collections and those turned out to be largely the maritime museums or museums that have a large maritime heritage as part of their collection. Um, 
A wide range of techniques were, were found in the banners and flags within those collections. So um, a quarter of them were painted. A large number were textile applique um, work. So that's like the traditional woolen flags that you might um, see for um, national flags, uh, naval flags and so on. A significant number were embroidered and then there were a large number, a third, which were either printed or woven. And um, one of the reasons that it has emerged that the flags and banners caused problems is often the scale of them. And um, most or a large proportion of them were large. And for the, many of the museums here in the Southwest, they are in historic buildings with quite cramped conditions. So it becomes a challenge to look, look after large objects. Um, in terms of condition, so about a quarter were said to be in excellent or good condition and the staff considered those to be safe for display. About half were in fair condition, so they might need some conservation to, to enable them to be displayed. But then almost a quarter were in poor condition with major structural damage or infestation and so on. And again, there's a, a similar distribution in terms of the storage conditions uh, for the banners and flags. So um, often they weren't very well supported. And sometimes the environmental conditions were a bit of a challenge. So um, we also wanted to think about what is it that the museums need from a project to improve the uh, collections care of the um, banners and flags. So most of them said that storage and display were their biggest challenges, but that they would also benefit from help with interpretation. So the first phase of the project and um, funding was sought and received from the Pilgrim Trust was to really focus on the collection's care of the flags and banners. So that broke down into several phases. The first was we offered a range of surgeries where museums could bring up to two flags or banners to a surgery for a condition assessment by textile conservator and also a paintings conservator where relevant and they would be photographed. And then these were followed by training sessions which brought together the staff and, um, and in the West Country many museums have a combination of both paid and volunteer staff and some rely entirely on volunteers. But, both the surgeries and especially the training sessions were also an opportunity to bring stuff from different museums together. And the, um, during the training sessions, we also wanted to provide the museums with materials to enable them to improve the collection's care of their flags and banners. And to ensure that the collection's care um, improvements were actually implemented, we had follow-up site visits to really make sure that they, the museums were able and were supported to make those um, collections care improvements. So for both the surgeries and the training, we realized because some of these objects are really quite large, we needed large spaces. So most museums, participating museums, didn't have large spaces in which to carry out these activities. So we used a range of civic buildings, meeting rooms and village halls where the participating museums could come. So maybe four, up to four museums would be there at any one time and could lay out their objects so that the conservators and the photographer could rotate around and do the assessments and the photography for each object. And then we also had an opportunity to discuss with the curators and staff from the participating museums. 
And in some cases, we were able to um, make small improvements to the collections care. So where uh, perhaps a large and fragile banner came up, just wrapped around its pole, if we had um, some an acid-free tube, we could actually wrap the banner around that tube, for instance. But largely, this was about assessment. So the types of um, flags and banners that we saw were very varied, both in what they were used for, their original use, the materials and the construction. But uh, with a combination of historic homes and um, museums representing uh, naval and, and military life, we saw um, a wide variety. So here, for instance, the top two on the left hand side are um, uh, military standards from a historic house, from a National Trust house. And then the other two are flags that was flown at the Battle of Waterloo and from the Royal Cornwall Museum. One group of banners that emerged from across the region were TOC H banners. And it's an organization that goes back to the First World War set up by a, um, uh, a priest or, yeah, as a, so a religious Christian organization to support the soldiers and later their communities um, after, the, after the First World War. And this included both men's groups or, or general talk age groups, but also women's sections, such as the one from St. Ives on the bottom there. I had been expecting perhaps to see um, union banners, but actually there were very few trade unions within the industries and, and um, in the south, in southwest England, which is largely rural and um, otherwise sort of maritime fishing. So we didn't see so many trade union banners, but we did see other working uh, banners. So from the China Clay uh, Museum at Will Martin and from the Telegraph Museum at Porth Kerno in West Cornwall. And two interesting um, or intriguing banners were from the Fairground Museum. And really they're almost like painting, well, they are painting on canvas, but they wouldn't, they weren't on stretches because they would be rolled and unrolled uh, each time the fair moved and they would be hung at on the stands on the, at the fairground events. There were also obviously maritime flags and banners. So the one on the left is from either Erebus or the Terror, the, um, the two ships used by Franklin in his search for the Northwest Passage. And they were salvaged on a later um, expedition to try and find um, any survivors and, and what had happened to the Franklin expedition. Um, then others are um, pennants from a, a sailing boat from the uh, National Maritime Museum in Cornwall. There were lots relating to young people, so particularly scouts and cubs, um, and also the Boys Brigade Company in uh, Mevagissi. And so although there's obviously got common motifs, there's quite a lot of um, idea of in, in individuality in the way the design is um, laid out and the banners are made. And in fact, the, the flag on the bottom right, the Wimple Wolf Cubs, is a, flag, a school flag that has been reused and changed into a scout's flag. And there were two very different Sunday school banners. So one, a very modest one, uh, stretched over a frame from um, Helston Museum is the Porth Hallow United Methodist um, Sunday School banner, which is a very simple um, inscribed banner, and then, uh, uh, which was probably made within the community. And then there's the Mevagissi Wesleyan Sunday School banner, which may have been commissioned from a banner maker, it has some similarities to banners, for instance, made by the Tutil Company, um, in that it's 
double-sided paint or paint on silk um but i'm sure yeah it may have been another maker that it was commissioned from and you start to see some of the problems with that kind of banner where the tension between the thick painted um, areas and the silk ground leads to splitting and almost the cutting out of the painted areas. And so although I said there weren't trade union banners, there were some friendly society banners. So those, instead of there being trade unions, they tended to be friendly societies which provided some of the services or support networks um, within the communities. So, um, and some of these uh, were definitely made by the Tootill uh, Banner Company in London. And these are double-sided silk painted with oil um, and uh, still attached to their wooden poles and often stored in their original wooden boxes. And the boxes would be labelled with the care instructions so that they mustn't be packed wet, for instance. Oops, batteries. <coughs> That's Sorry. Um, and then other painted banners. So, for instance, the Devonport uh, Women's Cooperative Guild was, is, has a different construction. It's, double, it's a thick double layer of a ribbed silk. There are also some campaigning banners. So, from Sidmouth, we have the Women's Suffrage Society banner, um, which is a reused cloth and um, painted and the Cornish language banner from St Ives Museum, very fragile linen banner painted with quite matte paint. So then I'm going to talk a bit about the type of damage that we found. So some of that damage occurred quite clearly or likely from use, so the fact that these most flags and banners will have been paraded or um, used outside so exposed to the elements the wind and the rain um, which are particularly prevalent in southwest england others are to do with their can some of the other damages due to due to their construction so i commented earlier on the um the issue around the thick paint on a very flexible silk sometimes causes the paint um to become the painted areas to become kind of cut out from the silk ground. And um, another thing that's very common is to see a lot of damage towards the fly end of a flag because the uh, hoist end is more constrained by the pole, whereas the fly end is the moving more in the wind. And so that's not untypical. And then these fairground uh, banners would be rolled and unrolled and exhibited outside so there again some of that damage is due to their use but other damage has occurred in um, storage whether that was in the museum or where it was stored before it came into a museum so for instance um, the woolen uh, scout flags had suffered some of them had suffered quite severe insect damage and insects are a real issue uh, carpet beetle and clothes moth in southwest England where it's very mild and wet all year round so um, conditions yeah that favour that and sometimes the the extent of the damage is is leads to quite severe um, loss. Um, less severe structural damage was also found you know uh, frequently so sometimes it was a combination of use um, so the end of a uh, one of the company flags, for instance, that's damaged from being flapping in the wind. Um, the Toc H banner on the right, that I think associated with Toc H, they would have lanterns and um, light the lantern. And it seems that maybe there the lantern has singed the banner in its um, original context. We also see surface damage, particularly on the painted flags. So whether that's abrasion, where the back painting is less well bound, but also um, flaking from the banners perhaps being rolled when they're still slightly damp and um, put under pressure. Um, 
and ab abrasion and so on. And also with the painted um, fairground banners, they would just be sprinkled with a bit of talc or something similar, rolled and re-rolled. And so in some areas they have the, they have sort of stuck to, the layers have stuck to each other and then where they've been rolled and unrolled, it's clear that the paint has pulled off where it's been stuck to an, an adjacent area. Some of them um, had been, uh, the image for instance was uh, uh, disfigured from old repairs, so sticky tape being stuck over them, things being repainted and so on. Um, staining from being wet or from being used in different areas and then fading. So here you can see a large number of these um, scouts flags had been dis um, displayed in church for instance or in the scout hut or the village hall and the um, folds most exposed to light have really faded and we saw that on several of the flags. And then the flag in the top right apparently um, would just be used to mop up spillages at the end of a scout session and that might explain the severe fading in some areas of the flag. We see the um, chemical deterioration partly from yeah the combination of materials so the silver paint on the right is tarnished and that may be in part from a, a rubberized treatment applied to the silk um, which may have uh, affected the, the silver and caused the silver to tarnish, or it might be from just damp environmental conditions and so on. Um, I mentioned the, the, the flag at the bottom being used for mopping up spillages. So there, that's obviously bleached out the, the dye. And then you can see the effect of damp causing copper corrosion on the metal thread embroidery on the other flag. So in the West Country, I've already sp spoken about the extent of insect damage, but also some of the flags were really, um, had quite a lot of fungal infestation on them. So had to be treated with the right um, sort of health and safety precautions. And then because flags and banners are used and reused, so whether they're processed once a year or um, flown outside, um, regularly, they have often been repaired and sometimes those repairs are done very sensitively but other times it uh, seems like it's a bit of an emergency, let's get out the sticky tape and just tape over the um, splits and so on. But then that leads to more long-term damage as the adhesive migrates from the tape carrier and is absorbed into the textile and either um, causing staining, embrittlement, accelerating chemical deterioration in the areas where it's been applied. So, um, and it's also quite difficult to reverse. So that uh, was quite challenging in some of the conservation treatments. And finally, um, these had been stored in a range of places um, before they'd come into museum collections. And some of the museums historically have also struggled with providing the right kind of storage environment. So a lot of objects were really quite dusty, um, sometimes just with loose dust like this, or other times with quite sticky, sooty soiling, perhaps from historic heating um, systems. So once we have got a sense of the condition of the objects, the range of objects, then um, we did some training sessions. And so these covered things like, um, well, th these were very practical. So there'd be a combination of presentation, but also a lot of activities. So um, people working together in small groups or pairs and then feeding back into the group. And it also gave me an opportunity to give some feedback to make sure that people were learning and understanding what um, we were trying to communicate. So we looked at how to record the banners and flags, the, how to document them and describe them, and then also how to record the deterioration and try and identify possible causes of that deterioration. So if there's perhaps active deterioration, signs of um, pest infestation or mold or um, 
the physical effects of not providing enough support in storage or display. And then we talked about the environmental requirements um, and how to try and achieve those in the, in the challenging kind of historic buildings that we've got in the West Country. And then because um, storage was a real issue, we um, provided the materials for them to improve their storage, but also actually practiced rolling large flags and banners and um, how to use their acid-free tubes and paper and so on. And then finally, we looked at making padded boards so that they could would be able to display their smaller flags and banners within their um, display areas. And the training days were also, I was struck by, they were really an important um, opportunity for museum staff in the local area to get together and share their experiences and, and build their networks. So each museum was provided with acid-free tubes uh, of different di uh, diameters according to their collection of banners and flags and sufficient for them to be able to store all their larger banners and flags on uh, enrolled storage. We also gave them materials that were, sometimes it was like a sample. So this was for, mag for them to be able to use um, rare earth magnets and steel for displaying uh, banners and flags. So for temporary displays, um, things to make the padded, make up padded boards. They also had pens and labels for documentation, gloves for handling and so on. So here, um, this is a follow up site visit, but two of the museum staff are extending a roller to make it long enough to take um, some of their wider flags. So an important element of the um, project was the follow-up um, support. So going on site and actually physically helping people to roll their flags, identify how best to incorporate it within their store or store it, whether to hang the rollers or um, support them on shelves and so on. And so that meant that actually concretely the um, storage of the banners and flags was improved um, in, the, in the participating museums. And this was a lovely museum in uh, St Ives right in the West Country which is in an old pilchard factory and they have really a large collection of um, banners and flags largely from ships um, so, you, and they're hung on open display. And um, they recognised that they really needed to find somewhere to store them. And ideally, it should be an internal store with no external walls and, uh, and so on. And they did find this, um, have this small attic, which wasn't necessarily very accessible. And when I first looked at it, it was full of old mannequins. But they were a very, very dynamic team and they uh, cleared the space from all the material that didn't need to be kept and you know made it good sealed all the holes um, and also created a pulley system to get the banners and flags into the store so really um, despite the challenges of their building they were very successful in um, finding a good space or an, a, a much better space to store their flags and banners and they recognized that some of the flags such as this one on the right really needed to come down. Unfortunately, um, somebody who had done a lot of work on rigging on ships was quite happy to climb the ladder to get the, the banner down because I'm not sure I would have been. Um, so that was the flying the flag, the kind of collections care part of the project. Then uh, Southwest Museum's development program was successful in gaining funding for a second phase of the project called Raising the Standard. So that focused on the conservation, display, interpretation and research of the, some of the banners and flags um, and it included 10 museums. So they had, uh, and I will just go through the different phases of that project. Um, as we go through. So it's a very short introduction. Um, I'll just show you 30 seconds of a video because I'm aware it might not um, 
would be the easiest thing to do via Zoom. So I'll just show you a short clip. Raising the Standard is a project working with 10 museums and heritage organisations from across Devon and Cornwall to share the stories and history of 15 diverse and vibrant banners held within their collections. Mm -hmm. Four of these banners show how people make real change happen and have an impact far beyond the geography of their local towns and villages. Included in the group is a banner from the Sidmouth and District Suffrage Branch, a Primrose League banner from South Moulton Museum, the Grand Pound Society banner, and an old Cornwall Society banner from St Ives Museum. Well, sorry, is that okay? Yeah, I'll go on. Um, so now I'll talk about the treatment of some of the flags so and um, banners. I um, worked with the paintings conservator, Sophie Brummett, on painted flags and banners. And um, some of the other uh, objects were treated in Bristol at Textile Conservation Limited. So um, I will just focus briefly on um, a few of four of the uh, flags and banners now. So this is the old Cornish one, which is actually written in the Cornish language, which unfortunately is no longer spoken as a continuous living language, although there are people who are learning it um, and uh, campaigning to have better education in Cornwall and so on. And this is, uh, has a linen ground and obviously had been paraded outside. I think they had found uh, photographs of it being used in parades and so on. But it had also been just mounted in a hardboard frame and had become very acidic um, and brittle. And there was some paint loss. The inscriptions weren't necessarily very clear. Um, so, um, Sophie worked on... Uh, consolidating the paint and the red in particular was very fugitive but all of the paints were flaking and then we um, did tests cleaning tests with an agar gel and which really did reduce some of the brown staining the kind of cellulose degradation staining and um, enabled the white ground to be seen more clearly as you see in the top right hand corner so that was um, carried out and then um, the tears and splits were given a localized adhesive support with a silk crepeline and then it was mounted onto a board um, to give it good physical support both in storage and display particularly as it's not an overly large banner so um, it could be handled more safely and displayed safely and so on the uh, next one is the Mevagissi Sunday School banner, which was the banner which in a way started the whole project. And this had been uh, treated with various adhesive tapes. It had been stored in a very damp environment, had very thick mould on the, uh, which had caused the almost full deteriorate degradation of the um, braid border along one side. Um, had caused damage to the paint. There were uh, clothes moth uh, infestation. There'd been a clothes moth infestation in the fringing. Um, so really quite a poor condition. The uh, silk had come away from the painted areas, particularly at the lower end of the banner. The paint surface was flaking and cracking. There was quite a large area of loss on the face of the Christ figure. Um, so quite a challenging object. So the first phase was really to remove as much of the fungal material um, as possible. And that was done in uh, the Royal Albert Memorial Museum in Exeter has an offsite store with a sort of decontamination room, if you like. And so I was able to remove the mold um, there using uh, full PPE um, to make sure I didn't inhale any of it. And so once that was done, the, um, 
we work to remove the adhesive uh, coating that had uh, come off these adhesive tapes using a range of solvents. Um, and then Sophie consolidated the paint layers um, and she did some retouching on the face that was going to be displayed. So on the left hand side of the two images is the um, face that is on display in the museum. And so for legibility, she did do some retouching, although she didn't recreate the features. On the other side, she simply consolidated the paint and didn't do any retouching. But for this, um, Banner. There was uh, I carried out stitch support to the braid, but for the main field of the uh, banner, um, I dyed silk crepeline. But in order to ensure there would still be some legibility on the face that wasn't going to be seen, I then painted the dark blue areas onto the dyed um, silk, which you can see in the top right-hand corner and then set that um, dye paste by steaming it. And that was adhered then to the reverse of the banner. So that's why the legibility on the right hand image isn't quite as good as on the left hand side. Um, but that was the technique used there. And then it was um, mounted onto the uh, fabric covered board. So, um, then we have the little, um, the very modest uh, Porthallo Sunday School banner. And again, Sophie did a lot of work consolidating, cleaning and consolidating the paint. One of the big problems with this was that it had been pinned and nailed to the wooden frame several times. And the, um, this had caused iron corrosion on the fabric and actually caused holes to come up on the fabric. Um, and so, um, the nails were removed and the frame covered in fabric, which you can see in the middle um, picture, and so that it could be stitched onto the frame without the stress of the nailing. And then a large part of the treatment otherwise was really cleaning. It was really heavily soiled. So using mechanical cleaning methods, things like smoke sponge, but also on the um, border, I used a microfiber cloth to help remove some of the more ingrained soiling. Then we have the suffrage banner. This was generally in good condition. There was the main problem was that it was constrained by the cord uh, border. So the field of the banner was sagging. Um, and there were localized holes, there was insect damage to the fringing and insect debris. But um, so it needed some localized support. So um, dyeing fabrics, patch support, using net overlays on the borders and so on. And this was a similar case, although it very, looks very different. Again, the field was really sagging within the uh, cord frame um, and so it needed humidification and also there was a thick interlining which was folded over within the between the lining and the front of the banner so that needed I uh, used humidification and then was able to ease it out and make it lie flat within the um, sandwich if you like and there were lots of little um, sawdust or wood splinters caught up in the back so they all needed removing and then the stitch support was quite limited it really only needed um work where the um edges of the applique had come loose so that was a more simple plan. so then another important phase of the raising the standard project was a uh, research help supporting the museums with research of their objects and um, a specialist heritage researcher was hired to work with the museums to help them with perhaps they were, most museums are very good on their local knowledge but i think um the research was able to support them with um perhaps more in-depth techniques and how to write 
up their research and share their research. But um, the research led to some really good findings such as original images of the banners being used, being able to talk to people who had experience of using the banners or caring for the banners, um, and also enabled the museums to renew links with community associations. So there was quite a moving event at Saltash uh, in near Plymouth with um, surviving members of a TOC, local TOC H association and they had a tea party and that's seen on the Twitter feed at the bottom there. Um, they did a lot of work. Some of the museums were very successful in their community engagement. So for instance, Sidmouth Museum worked with girl guides to make objects relating to the women's suffrage movement. They made dolls and um, bags and things celebrating 100 years of votes for women and talked about the whole women's suffrage movement. So that was a really successful um, activity over a number of months. And the museums with the scout uh, flags also worked closely with their local scouts groups. And in Cornwall, um, there is quite a strong tradition of um, annual events where there are banners made and processed and so on. So Grand Pound and Mevagissi focused on activities around those to engage local school children and older members of the community. And I've already touched on Sotash. Um, so as a result of these projects, I'm, I think we can be confident that the banners and flags have much better collection care, both through the training and the supply of materials to enable um, museums to actually make the changes. And the networks between the museums have been strengthened and they had really quite successful community engagement projects. And then the actual raising the standard um, part of the project has enabled them to display objects that they wouldn't otherwise have been able to display and provide good interpretation of those objects. So I'd like to thank everyone at the Southwest Museum's Development Programme, including Vic Harding and Helena Jeschke and all the um, people I, we worked on on the project, so Sophie Brummett, Gary Young, Nikki Chard, the Textile Conservation Limited, and all the in really enthusiastic um, staff at the museums, as well as obviously the funding bodies and um, this opportunity to share the, our experiences of the project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marina. Thank you so much. That was a very interesting talk and we have questions. So if you're ready, I'll start with those. Yes, thanks. So the first question regarding the project. So um, question is about the survey that you were undertaking. So was the condition survey done by seeing all flags and banners and collections across the museums or was it the result obtained on the basis of a sample survey? Those graphs that you showed us. So the graphs were self-reported. So that was museums, so non-specialists saying, we think this number and this condition or that condition. The surgeries were very, were a small sample but it wasn't a random sample. So museums were invited to bring two banners or flags that were of significance to them. They were invited to bring those to a surgery. And so those were given a full condition survey um, by specialist conservators. So. so there was a complete survey was not done of all the museums in that area. Yeah, so the complete survey was self-reported. So that wasn't a, a, a careful condition assessment, no. Okay. And the next question, thank you. The next question is, do you have a condition report specially designed for flags and banners? Yeah, so I tend to use the categories that I went through in terms of damage, but I did develop uh, or modify the forms, yeah, to reflect the fact that they were banners and flags. So you know, in terms of the terminology, um, because obviously if they're double-sided, you can't talk about the left side and the right side and things like that. And to reflect the, the 
construction techniques that came up. But um, yeah, so I adapted a more generic textile form that I used for this project. Thank you. The question is what kind of measures were taken to improve environmental conditions? What measures work best against high humidity values? So um, in this project, we weren't actively working on the environment, but really the training was to flag the issues associated with environmental problems. So, um, so in terms of the environmental, if we would point them in the direction of res further resources, but talking about, you know, really they should try to keep their relative humidity stable and below 65% which can be a real challenge in particularly some of the coastal communities and um, in, in the Southwest. Um, and also talking about buffering. So that's why St. Ives were encouraged to use the, the store that was inside, um, had no external walls and so on. But, um, and then talk about things like de dehumidifiers or um, something that's used quite a lot here is conservation heating, so humidity statically controlled radiators. Um, so it's, yeah, we talked about that, but that, that was not a part of the follow-up um, in actually making changes. It was more an, a part of the training and talking about it and identifying improvements they could make, but it was sort of tailor-made really, or adapted to each environment. Okay. Thank you. The next question is, did you roll, uh, wherever rolling was involved for storage, did you roll with the primary surface uh, out or in? Out. Find, okay. And did you yeah. find it best to use larger complete sheets of acid-free tissue or several sheets to avoid wrinkling? What was preferred? M much preferred using long sheets of acid-free tissue rather than lots of small ones. Yeah. So, um, so that was another material that was provided as part of the Flying the Flag project was long rolls of acid-free tissue, uh, unbuffered acid-free tissue, because most of the flags were either silk or wool. So, I mean, obviously they were cotton linen, but, you know, because of the prevalence of silk and wool, then we specified unbuffered acid-free tissue and uh, rolls of it rather than sheets. Okay. Yeah, and so we rolled between two layers of tissue and onto acid. We were fortunate to be able to have a budget for acid-free tubes as well, because obviously sometimes that's not possible. So then people have to seal another yeah. kind of tube. Um, so. mm. Thank you. The question is, after the flags were conserved, if they were to be displayed, what are the methods that you would suggest for display of banners and flags? This, Sorry, could you repeat the first part? Sorry. Uh, after conservation, if one has to display a flag or a banner, what are the methods that you would suggest? So it depends on the size, obviously, and whether they're original fixings um, and, the, and the condition. So um, if a, a conserved flag or banner has good structural integrity, um, then you could consider, for instance, using magnets. So um, either having a magnet set into the back of a display board and then um, having your steel strip sandwiched in fabric over the front of the object. So um, Gwen Spicer in the States has done a lot of work on magnets and has really good blogs and um, things accessible online as well as her book on how to use magnets. So that's quite nice for a temporary display and that's what I use. Um, there's a National Trust house in South Devon called Buckland Abbey which has some flags associated with Francis Drake and they are rotated every two or three years so there we use magnets um, because they're huge. They're, you know, 1.8 meter by 1.8 meter at least or, or more. Um, and so, and they're within a really lovely display case. So that's a good environment. So um, with 
for instance, that the Mevagissi Sunday School banner, we knew like that museum is right on the harbour front. So we specified that it had to go in the case to try and um, protect the environmental conditions for the banner and flag. But it was so fragile that um, we fixed it to a board. That one I fixed to a padded, a fabric covered board. So that one was actually stitched to the board. That poses a challenge when it comes off display and goes into storage, but they don't have much storage space. So that's likely to be on long-term display. Um, for smaller bag uh, banners and flags, it's good to make a sm small padded board and then depending on the condition, either stitch or use magnets um, to apply them. And one thing in terms of um, uh, uh, sorry, um, oh yeah, so in terms of rolling, so the paintings conservator, you know, paintings aren't often rolled, sometimes very large ones are rolled for storage. So she would prefer for things not to be rolled but obviously most museums can't store huge painted banners flat so rolling becomes a necessity so it really depends on on the individual case of the museum so yeah, yeah. thank you the other question is um, what adhesive did you use for attaching the kepline on your flags and bags. that was a Lascaux mix, Lascaux uh, four nine eight and three o three mix. Um, I think maybe twelve percent or fifteen percent. Uh, yeah, I don't have my notes right in front of me, but that was yeah, a, a, an acrylic adhesive. Thank you. Uh, what were some of the challenges of working with different institutions, as uh, same resources, equipment, staff, money? may not have been available everywhere. So what were some of the challenges in the project? So in this project, what was nice is because it was externally funded, theoretically they all had the same resources in terms of doing the conservation work. What I really loved was the fact that they were all very different. So doing the follow-up work, going on site to do the help with the collections care, I really liked the fact that you know, some were entirely volunteer run, but very willing to learn and or and use their skills as well and to kind of be aware of what resources they had. So um, I know it can be challenging, um, but I think that was why it was important that we got funding for the project for all the participating museums. So the, maybe the, the limitations would be the space they had available to store things or the space they had available to display things. And um, one thing was, for instance, one museum couldn't participate because the objects didn't actually belong to the museum, they were on long-term loan. So then they weren't eligible to participate in the conservation project. But um, I quite like the challenge of working with museums with different resources and different um, approaches. So obviously sometimes it's easy when you go to a large local authority museum. Like yesterday, I was in a really lovely store in a museum that's got a big redevelopment project helping mount some costume, you know, they've got the materials, they've got the resources, that's very nice um, and does make life easy, some easier sometimes, but, I think sometimes the impact that it, um, your work has in a museum that really wants the project to happen and has to work really hard to make it happen is also very rewarding. So. Yes. Thank you. Mm. What was the cues, uh, what was the, the, what was used for consolidating flaking paint layers in the banners? I, so I didn't do that part of the work and I haven't got the reports right in front of me but I think it varied very much so uh, Sophie tested looked at the kind of paint um, so a range of different consolidants according to the particular banner the paint and its condition so she it varied and sometimes were water-based and some were solvent based and so on yeah thank you a lot of queries regarding the magnet mounting that you 
referred the blog, the name of the blogger who referred that. But I think Karen French wrote it was um, Gwen Spicer. Yeah, G W E N S P I C E R. So it's there in the chat box. Yeah. So yeah, she's done a lot of really thorough work, and it's there's quite interesting things. Like for instance, it can be good to have um, a polyester layer rather than a cotton layer between the metal and the magnet because the the natural fiber layers seem to dampen the effect of the magnets, whereas somehow the artificial fibers maybe even enhance it. So there's, she's done a lot of very thorough work. So it's okay. definitely, and a lot of her work is on her blogs. So, yeah. yeah. So I think any more questions? I think I've taken most of the questions here. So thank you, thank you, Verena. Thanks a lot for your uh, time. She also put in the reference, uh, blog references there in the chat box. So everyone, please note that down. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Uh, thank you, Verena. And um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. It was thank an interesting you. talk. And I think most of us got a lot about flags and banners, and I'm sure there are more questions we will be addressing you. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Thank and you very much. The next lecture is day after tomorrow. Again, we have Julia and uh, Julia Brennan. We'll be talking about storage and display. So please do join us, all of yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you, Marina. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.